It's Bigfoot Collectors Club with Bryce and Michael. I know a ghost story or two. Let's do this. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of what? High strangeness. That's right. That's right. I'm your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host... Bryce Johnson. And our super producer. Riley Bray. And yeah. guess what, you listeners? This week, we have no guests. We're doing things a little bit differently here in August, because today we are kicking off our first multi-episode story of high strangeness. It's uh, maybe the most anticipated story of all time for me personally. <laughs> Uh, I'm, of course, talking about the Roswell incident. Maybe you've heard of it. Maybe you <laughs> heard of it. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Roswell incident. <laughs> heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, we're talking Roswell today. All things, everything, the Roswell incident. Uh, how it relates to what happened then, how it relates to today. And I mean, what a better summer to decide to do this. We've been planning this for a couple months now. This is probably our most research intensive. <laughs> like, we're, I think Bryce <laughs> and I are like really trying to prove ourselves this time out. Like, we are reading books, we are watching documentaries. I am like guzzling rose and grinding my teeth and drawing my shades. And now I'm pr- <laughs> just pretty sure sure the government's come to get me i've been living my like wildest fox molder quarantine life I, I i mean i i literally was getting so paranoid research paranoid researching this story at one point i was putting on last week i was putting on the roswell movie with kyle mclaughlin and martin sheen and like two minutes into it i was like nope you have to stop you have to stop take a break <laughs> Watch something else. Let's let's go watch. I don't get it. What but so, I'm so close. I'm what are you so close. About this happened 70 years ago. What I, are you? <laughs> well, I'm just scared of aliens in general. And then also, gotcha. I, I just it was just it's all I was thinking about. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's really. And then we were originally going to drop this episode last week, uh, but we lost connections with Bryce. He was in a top secret location. So yep. I got a little bit of a break from it. Not quite, but now well, actually, I think you described it as Roswell blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we were so, I, so ready to go last week. I felt that too. I had to take a walk around the block. I was like, Oh, Oh, <laughs> And then immediately after, my wife calls me because my son wanted to uh, cash in on some Fortnite V Buck cards, and I couldn't get the passwords. And I, I don't fucking know. I got it. Just, I'm having tech. I just got to get out of here. Yeah, Bryce and I hopped on the phone after it all fell apart last week, and I've never <laughs> heard you more upset. Like you were just about to give up. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, well, you- it works. Yeah, whatever. But you know what? We're gonna we're gonna get to it today because I'm in a good spot with good Wi-Fi, uh, and you, the audience, will uh, reap the benefit. Yeah, I think this is going to be really interesting because, uh, and I and let's let's put a pin on Roswell for a moment, actually, because I want to talk about a couple things up top real quick, okay. and we're gonna get it into it. Um, little uh, housekeeping right up top. Do not forget that our Wet Hot Alien Summer t-shirts by James Maholland, that cool new retro 80s design, are still available yep. uh, right now on our uh, merch shop over at wearecampfire.media. That's our network. You go nail that shop button. You scroll down. We've got it on stickers and mugs and everything now. Get and one a- for yourself. Get one for the kids. I got myself a tank top, show off the guns. It's Ooh. on and popping. 
I just ordered a hoodie. I cannot wait until oh, it comes. Oh, nice. So excited. My t-shirt should be here any day. Um, and of course, we've got a regular BCC logo one. We've got a couple um, other Bigfoot Collectors Club designs. We've got our high strangeness devil, Bryce's red devil that uh, was drawn by um, Ryan Cody, who worked with me on my adventure van comic book. So there's a lot of fun stuff up there. So please go check that out. And then last week at the end of the show, Riley made a little announcement. Um, Riley, do you want to follow up on that request? Yeah. I mean, so we're putting together a music video for our single, Completely Absorbed by the Strange. And I just really <laughs> wanted to reach out to uh, the audience and see if, if anyone wanted to send anything in. And now that can be that can be you just like grooving and getting down to it. That can be some weird <laughs> visual that you could set up. That can be a time that you filmed the UFO in the sky. That can be literally anything. Well, you, just let's something let's that you think anything vibes. within limits. Keep it. <laughs> we, keep it. We, I mean, yeah, keep no limits on. to this thing, guys. <laughs> the doors no are bar. wide open. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, get creative with it. Get weird with it. Get artistic with it. And let's try to make something together. I think Amazing. it'd be a lot of fun. So please just send us some some uh you know footage for the music video that we're all going to make together incredible fantastic be a part of it be part of greatness <laughs> be- but keep your clothes on <laughs> bigfoot collectors club <laughs> heard of it um all right before we get into today's big topic we have some basic say no that was honestly the best you guys have done since we've been doing this remotely. Wow. Good job. T- All right. Take Good it job. slow and steady. Uh, this story was actually sent to us by a Patreon listener, uh, Joe. Uh, this was a cool one. I'm assuming Joe lives up in Canada because she sent in the headline. This is from CTV News in Canada. UFO sightings across Canada have spiked during the pandemic. This is by Kayla Mm. Rosen. Uh, In Winnipeg, there's been a significant increase in UFO sightings across Canada during the pandemic, according to a UFO researcher. Chris Rutowski, a UFO researcher, said Canada keeps track of all the UFOs reported throughout the years. In 2019, there were 849 cases, a 10% decrease from the year before. But it seems things, and Canadians, heard of them, are looking up this year. We're looking at an increase of about 50% from this time last year. So for some reason, people are reporting more UFOs during lockdown, Rutowski said. Rutowski said, for the most part, UFO sightings are explainable, but every so often one comes along that makes people scratch their heads. You know, most cases are just ordinary mistakes, misidentifications, but there are some cases every year. There are some cases every year. In fact, last year, there was about 3% that remained unexplained. That didn't seem to be airplane stars, fireballs, and all, all types of things, he said. Mm. Rutowski added that the reports are coming from across Canada from coast to coast. We're getting reports from pilots who are reporting that they're receiving collision alerts on their transponder systems and there's nothing there uh he said we're getting reports from air traffic controllers saying that there's objects in the sky that don't show up on radar and we're getting reports from just average ordinary people looking up at the sky and saying that's not a plane that's not a star it's been flashing lights in different colors we're not sure what it is rutowski hopes that the reason there's a spike in ufo sightings during the pandemic is because canadians are getting outside more working from their backyards and appreciating nature it's and that's exactly it it's like you know people are smoking weed in lawn chairs and looking up i mean it just it makes sense sweet unless, bc bud yeah oh for sure unless we forget you know that only represents about 10 percent of the reported cases usually you know um most people don't report what they see yep and uh rutowski ends up by saying it's a beautiful sky out there and there's a lot of opportunities to see some things he said and uh there in this article there is a full 2019 ufo report from uh, a Canadian UFO survey. Uh, it's long, but it's interesting. I was skimming through it and it kind of goes like, you know, month to month and tells you what people saw and all that stuff. So I'll throw that up on the show notes. But yeah, it is interesting. We talked about the subject a little bit with Tenny uh, a few months ago about how people were having, you know, more paranormal encounters during the quarantine because people are just at home and they're hearing sounds in their houses that, you know, they haven't heard before uh because they've been too busy with their lives uh and and now we're kind of seeing a little bit of the same thing when it comes to ufos just more people are stopping and paying attention Mm, wild 
Yeah, I think it's interesting that everyone, when you slow down and stop, you start noticing all the the strange things around you. It's 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 kind of a weird benefit of this whole strange time we're going through. Yeah, Makes sense to me. I can't believe I didn't notice that goblin that stares at me from the corner of my office. <laughs> Don't long. notice him now either. Boy, oh boy. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time to talk Roswell. All right, boys, here we go. It's Roswell. Uh, we're kicking off our Roswell High Strangeness. Uh, this could go for, I mean, honestly, it could be the rest of the series with as much information about Roswell that there is out there. I mean, it is it's a lot. crazy. There's so much stuff. I think it is I think it is the most wild, w- widely reported, investigated, talked about UFO story of all time. So there's just hands down tons of shit out there. I mean, it's in, you know, and then just all the times it pops up in pop culture. We're going to get to that um, eventually. But I kind of wanted to kick off this series by asking both of you and Riley, maybe we'll start with you because you're not the one that's been consuming all this crap for the past few weeks. Um what is your take or what do you know about Roswell uh, before before we get into all of this? I mean, to be quite honest, what I know about Roswell is not a lot. Um, I mean, I know it was in 47, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Okay, yeah. A, cla- a crash or alleged crash in a town outside of Roswell somewhere. Um, and that it was reported in the papers immediately. And then that story was redacted in an official military story came out and that's and then you know that there's some people say there's bodies there uh but that's pretty much the extent of of what i know i mean i know about it from like you know x files when i was a kid that's it's sort of that first alien paranormal story you hear you know that kind of gets you going on everything but I would say beyond that, I, I haven't done a tremendous amount of research on it. I yeah, don't really know and, much. But I'd I mean, say that's pretty that, good. That's you know? it. I mean, that is the story in a nutshell. And on the surface, this is what's so fascinating about this case, because on the surface, it's very simple. You know what I mean? You can explain the whole story in two or three sentences. But then once you start to look closer, it just becomes this quagmire of, of different witnesses different people all these intersecting narratives the timeline is weird um there are contradictions all over the place and you know this has been now a big topic of research really in ufology for about 40 years now yeah and there's been and people- i think we're going to talk about some of those those contradictions oh, and stuff and we have and- to you can't Absolutely. talk roswell without uh, without talking about the contradictions um but yeah i was the same way riley i mean I knew a little bit more about it than I think the average, you know, listener to this show. Um, I knew some of the big names and the people involved. I've been to Roswell. I took a tour with a guy named Dennis Balthazar, and um, he was super rad. Drove me and my buddy around Roswell, pointed out all the historical sites that are still there. Unfortunately, a lot of these places are being, you know, are being torn down. Um, Half the airfield, old airfield base is basically, you know, because it's not, it's no longer an active um, army base. So Mm. the hangar where they supposedly brought the wreckage is still there, (coughs) but like the hospital where they supposedly allegedly, um, Dissected the bodies. Dissected aliens, and maybe it tried to save one of the aliens, maybe did save one of the aliens. That's gone now. Uh, The newspaper, the Daily Record office is still there, but a lot of these historical sites are are being taken down. And it was really, for me, it was that tour and listening to Dennis tell the story sort of in, you know, not obviously not in real time, but getting to drive around and see uh, some of the houses that belong to some of the main players, it, it really brought the story to life. And it was the first time that I heard it and went, you know what? I think this was actually possible because, and Bryce and I were just talking about this before we recorded, there was no precedent. There was no protocol in 1947 for what should happen if a UFO crash landed somewhere. And what I think this story shows is the army, the military in Washington figuring out how to respond to this. If it was, if it is what, what we, we want to believe it is 
We're watching them figure out how to contain this story and deal with the the, the reality of a crashed UFO with aliens in it and, you know, how to deal with that. Let me add to that. While there was no precedent set for something like this happening, all the facilities and all the compartmentalization was already in place. I mean, we were coming just off of the heels of World War II, creating the Manhattan Project, which created the first atomic bombs. And, you know, people working on that project, nobody knew what the other one was doing. And those that, that, that there, there were hundreds of engineers and scientists working on that project, but yet nobody really know entirely the big picture of what they were working on. That's- so the, appar- the apparatus of compartmentalization was already in place and perfect for something like a crashed spaceship totally, to happen. Totally, totally a fantastic point. I mean, when you read these stories and when you listen to some of these eyewitness accounts, the, it's a tough thing because one character knows one piece of, an, of information, another character in the story will have witnessed something else. It's like it's like everyone in the town of Roswell that was involved is holding one piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And researchers have been trying to put that in, that puzzle together to get a complete image for, for 40 years years now and now all these witnesses are gone basically and even some of their children and second and third hand witnesses are have passed on so it's a story that's that's really erasing with t- time you know what i mean so the, the, the part of part of this is like trying to preserve the narrative as best as possible stan friedman said and i love this quote researching roswell is a race with the undertaker and he's absolutely right you know all the people who had firsthand knowledge or or who were there are are dying i mean there's less than a handful of them today yeah and and one more point on this too is that that i thought you brought up nicely that this there was no precedent at the time there was no protocol but i do think what happened at roswell set the protocol moving forward for the Mm -hmm. government's role in covering up uh information about ufos and we're seeing you know we're in the middle of this summer now where it's come back around and it's really popular and people are talking about disclosure everything that's happening in the news today you can trace all of that back all the pentagon secret programs all this stuff all the whistleblowers it all leads back to roswell so this is really like the point Um, i mean it was just last month new york times released an article about possible crashed retrieval programs so you're exactly right all of this is coming back full circle in our faces today and there's really a, a paradigm shift people view ufos and crashed spaceships differently today than they did 50 years ago so bryce before we start we didn't hear your background with roswell do you remember ever knowing a? do you ever remember a time when you didn't know what roswell was because i feel like i've always <laughs> sort of known about it yeah i feel like that too right i feel like uh, you know l- like you said earlier this had to be the biggest uh quote unquote alien spaceship alien body event ever to happen and especially uh right here in our own backyard in new mexico Roswell represented to me the idea that this was going to be our best chance our, at, at actually proving that we are being visited by extraterrestrial beings. And it also represented to me uh, the idea that the government, our government, doesn't want us to know about it. Or better yet, they don't think we're ready to hear the truth. And that always I, that always uh, rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, And, you know, there's various reasons to think that maybe that's the case. Maybe they wanted to figure out for themselves what was going on. Maybe they wanted to militarize uh, these technologies. I don't know. But they took the lead on it. They left us in the dark. And I'm not cool with that. I mean, we can pretty much prove <laughs> that there was a Loosen gu- up, big brother. Yeah, we can pretty much. I want to see them aliens. I want to see them aliens. Uh, that there was a government I, cover I, I, up. I, There's I, no I, doubt about that. I can't help but just already hear the new Club Rise track that's playing with those quotes in it. <laughs> Rice versus Big Brother. Um, all right. Well, let's get into it. 
Let's so, do it. So the legend of Roswell is essentially oral history. That's because very few written records of what exactly crash landed in the New Mexican desert in July of 1947 exist. What we have mostly is a newspaper story from the Roswell Daily Record from Tuesday, July 8th. 1947, claiming that the Roswell Army Air Force recovered a crashed flying saucer. A newspaper story that redacted that story by a man named General Ronald Ramey on Wednesday, July 9th, who explained the UFO was actually a wrecked weather balloon. A few more official, a few more official explanations were released by the U.S. government over the years, involving a secret balloon project and a few dummies. A handful of memos were turned up by ufologists digging through the past. But if photos of the downed craft exist, we don't have them. If pictures of the alleged alien bodies also discovered in the wreckage exist, they have not been leaked to the public. Despite numerous hoaxes that have turned up over the years, check out our episode on the Roswell slides over on the other side for more info. All we really have is a story that was passed down by eyewitnesses, most of whom are all now dead, to their families, their close friends, and investigators. Many witnesses were career military men who remained silent for decades out of sworn duty, and some were civilians who allegedly kept quiet out of fear of retaliation against themselves or their families by our government uh, if they spoke about what they saw. Yeah, and we will prove that there was retaliation taken <laughs> against these witnesses. I don't know if we can prove anything. We will hands down prove that on today's episode. I don't episode. know if we want to pick Strap a fight with the military. In. <laughs> this is all alleged, remember. You know, again, we I don't, don't like that have word. any proof. And we have to remain sort of open-minded to both sides. But sure. what we have left is a legend that laid dormant for almost three decades before exploding back into the public imagination in the late 1970s and inspiring a generation of UFO lovers, conspiracy theorists, and Hollywood filmmakers to ponder the phrase, the truth is out there. Yeah, the it's Ro- given us so much, man. The Roswell incident marks a fork in the road of space-time. Two realities emerged from that small desert town back in the summer of 47. The first reality is the one that we are living in today. The one that men like General Ronald Ramey wanted us to live in. The other reality is that the proof of extraterrestrial life fell from the stars and landed in the pasture of of the Roberts Ranch. And the U.S. government covered it up, keeping the biggest discovery of human history and the alien technology that came with it secret from the world. In this multi-part series, we're going to get to know some of those witnesses and key players. We'll jump around in the timeline, work through the contradictions and inconsistencies to the story, of which there are many, but we'll also highlight the plausibility that something from another world did indeed crash in New Mexico shortly after the conclusion of World War II and the creation of the atom bomb. So... Join us as we go down the rabbit hole for one of the most anticipated stories of high strangeness, the Roswell Incident. Mm Mm-hmm. Roswell Part 1, The Cowboy Who Caught a Falling Star. Love that. The two weeks leading up to the mysterious crash saw the birth of the flying saucer craze in the U.S. On June 24th of that year, just a mere two weeks before the excitement at Roswell, flying businessman Kenneth Arnold spotted nine boomerang-shaped crafts flying in formation over Mount Rainier in Washington while piloting his plane on his way to a sales meeting. Arnold described the crafts moving similar to that of saucers skipping across water, and the newspapers turned that phrase into flying saucer. We covered this story with Jen Kirkman uh, last year, or it's been a while, but you you can go back and get uh, all the information on that. But I just love that this all started with a with a salesman who knew how to fly his own plane. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's great, and like so many great names, like. Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. It's always coined by some random reporter uh, who just took the terms that uh, Arnold was using to describe these vehicles and turned it into flying saucers, which is now just a part of everyone's lexicon. Yeah, and it's weird. You get a sense reading up on all this stuff that, like, just in those two weeks alone, this meme, you know, exploded and people were talking all about this. You know, 
fighter pilots had seen Foo Fighters in World War II. Yep. Uh, there were reports from Europe, I think in Germany and Sweden, of objects that they refer to as ghost rockets. Yeah. Um, and people were just seeing this shit, and it got really popular. Um, Ray Palmer, I'm reading a book on Ray Palmer right now, uh, who was the editor of Fate magazine, and you know he kind of took the flying saucer thing and ran with it. He was um, he covered a story that that Maury Island UFO story uh, yeah. about the people who uh, were fishermen who claimed that these donut shaped UFOs dropped all this weird metal on them on a beach. It's the first men in black encounter story. All this stuff is happening. Now that story, there's a lot of people who say that story is a hoax, but my point is that the mythology of the UFO and the flying saucer is all being born in this two week time period. And and it has everything in it that we still men in black flying saucers uh, strange alien beings all of it is happening in this little window of time i think it's a really they're here moment for the united <laughs> states you know totally. what i mean yeah, it's it's bizarre. So Roswell in 1947, it was a small town. You know, it's composed of dairy farms and ranches stretching for hundreds of miles in the surrounding New Mexican wilderness. It was a western town full of farmers and cowboys. And the other main industry was the army because Roswell was home to the Roswell Army Airfield. Yeah, that's right. This was so. This was uh, this was before the Air Force was its own separate branch. Uh, you know, so all these, uh, you know, the Roswell Army Airfield was part of the uh, part of the Army, where it held all sorts of. Uh, oh my God! But planes for <laughs> you know, uh, there was no Air Force, is what I'm saying. The Air Force didn't come till after this. Yeah, and in fact, Air Force was started in like I believe December of yeah, 1947, right. like six months <laughs> after this, which kind of makes me wonder if one of the reasons the Air Force became its own thing was because they made the discovery that there are uh, objects not of this earth flying around in our airspace. I mean, there's a good case to be made for that. Absolutely. So talk about uh, the the 509th, Bryce. Yeah. So just to give you a little uh, of idea about this Roswell Army um, airfield and, and the people who worked there, I'm going to read from uh, Witness to Roswell by uh, Thomas Carey and Donald Schmidt. The state of New Mexico in 1947 was the most sensitive and highly guarded area in our country, if not the entire world. Not only was there ongoing atomic research at Los Alamos, where the first atomic bomb was developed, but there was also the testing of captured German V-2 rockets taking place just to the south at White Sands near Alamogordo. Not far from Alamogordo was the Trinity site. The world's first atomic bomb was detonated, and at Roswell itself, which was the headquarters of the 509th Bomb Group, the only atomic strike force in the world at that time. It was the 509th that just two years earlier had dropped the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to end World War II. Little did they know that they would also become involved in one of the most significant and a historic events of all time, the crash of an unknown object from another world. So this isn't just some podunk army base. I mean, this is this is the world's top secret, uh, highly <laughs> classified bases in the world. Um, <laughs> hey, man, I'm sorry. Uh, listen, we don't have any ammunition. We don't have a lot going on here. We're just a podunk army right. base. You want to head down to the RAAF in Roswell. They'll, they'll get you situated. <laughs> nice nukes over there. Big ones. They got but them big God, bombs. I mean, it, it just... Got them V2s. Um, that is really, really interesting, though. Uh, that's a, I didn't know that connection. You know, and more than that, Riley, this is, this is really going to start to speak to the convenience of where this object crashed and the materials that people reported seeing uh, the crash. There's so many correlations uh, and conveniences. It, it makes for s the, just such a strange case. Well, it's just so wild. I mean, if you're one of if you're somebody who's getting super, you know, jazzed up about conspiracies and UFOs and aliens, like it's really hard to ignore the 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 one plus one of you have atomic bombs being tested and then you have a crashed UFO. Like yep. there's even yeah. theories that have, you know, I've heard for years that, you know, 
ripping, dropping the nukes out in New Mexico, ripped a hole in space time. And these crafts came out of that wormhole. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no, and then, absolutely. And then there are these, you know, really, this is like really out there theories that, you know, those bombs are so powerful that, you know, they're not just felt in this dimension. They're felt in all of our neighboring dimensions as well. Yeah. So I, well, if that's the case, we've ripped a lot of holes because well, they've blown up a lot of those bombs. I know. And it's so... <laughs> Think about that. I mean, think about maybe that's just Yikes. like opening, punching so many holes in our reality to let creatures in. I mean, it's a very Stephen King idea. It is. You know? oh, here, here's another crazy idea, and, and and we'll theorize as we go along this, uh, you know, these multiple episodes. But you know, I've often uh, as to what these beings were. But sometimes it's often been postulated that this could be us from our future. And so many times in alien contactee experiences, you hear about. Uh, atomic annihilation and 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 you were like you i often think that like if we were in the future where's the one time and place we would want to go back to fix things if something uh you know completely awful happened in our future say nuclear annihilation we would want to come back to here where they developed the bomb yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. Um, the other thing I wanted to note about the uh, Army or uh, the the RAAF base was that um, in World War II they kept uh, German uh, prisoners of war at the base. Um, That's great. So I didn't know that because because this area is just surrounded by. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of miles. Uh, in that desert of just, you know, ranch, you know, uh, ranches and farms. There's nothing. It's just a desert out there. So they yeah. kept German soldiers there because if they tried to get out and escape, there was nowhere to run to. It's the Alcatraz they, of the desert, man. Yep, it totally was. And they had German soldiers help build some of the infrastructure, uh, German prisoners, I should say, I infrastructure in Roswell. They dug a canal that runs through the town uh, near the base. And these these guys, uh, they secretly built a German iron cross and buried it in the canal that years later when the city was digging up the canal and uh, rerouting stuff, they found that these guys had built this, uh, had, they, they marked it with a giant iron cross. That's insane. It's sort of a fuck you to the U.S. Isn't that crazy? Wow, I had no idea. That's wild. So, so, there's, <clears throat> so then again, you also have this like weird, just like, Nazi history in Roswell as well. You know what I mean? Like it's it is a crossroads for all the weird and dark side of ufology. Uh, and and you know, it's 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 a very interesting place for being you know quote unquote uh, middle of nowhere. Wow. Uh, so yeah. what many of our listeners may not know is that the Roswell crash didn't actually happen in Roswell, but 75 miles northwest of the city in Corona, New Mexico, which was basically just a one horse town out in rancher territory. In the days leading up to the Roswell incident, people were seeing strange objects in the night skies. Bryce, you want to talk about a couple of the eyewitnesses that saw something in early July? Yeah, absolutely. I, I At first, I, I would just be remiss if I didn't mention what a strange synchronicity that happened in Corona and, and we're experiencing the coronavirus right now. Crazy. Whoa! Crazy. This is the problem. You get into this and you start seeing everything. You know what I mean? Like you start seeing <laughs> are connected. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is why it's I all like, coming together. This is why like last week I was like, take a break, Michael. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> well, here's something probably a lot of people may not realize, but people did see UFOs uh, just days before the Roswell crash. Don Wilmot and his wife ran a hardware store uh, right in town and they witnessed what they thought were two wash bowl bowls on top of one another. Um, just outside of Highway 285, and that was on July 2nd. Now, Not literal wash bowls, because the right. way he said it well, made it sound like they saw flying dishware. <laughs> right. Well, that's how that's how they described it, right? So it's that typical flying saucer shape uh, of two wash two two dinner plates, a stack, you know, one on top of another. Um, William, yeah, Wood I think they call it mouths touching, mm. which is such a weird <laughs> phrase. Well, and William Woody and his father saw a fiery object descending toward Earth. 
Now, a day or two later, they went to see if they could find where it landed. And this was also on July 2nd, the same date that uh, uh, that Don and his wife... Third, it was the on the third they saw it. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But Don and Don and saw it. And listen, this timeline is going to get crazy, guys. There's a, Bryce and I are going to be checking each other a lot because. But essentially, all you need to know is that most of what happens takes place the very first week of July of 1947. Basically, yeah. these events run from July 1st through the Fourth of July weekend, and then into the middle of the next week. So we're talking like the first through the ninth of July is basically when all of this takes place. Yeah, that's right, and and. And they said that they had went out a day or two later to see if they could find where whatever this thing was landed and that they ran into a military cordon, which was a cordoned off area. And I had that was like, oh, that that doesn't add up, because if they saw this thing on the third, that means they would have ran into a military military cordon on the fifth. And the military didn't get there until the eighth. So already I was like, well, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, but I think also, too, with these witnesses, and again, this is the problem with, like, this goes back to the Stanton Friedman comment, like, you know, they're being, they're talking about this stuff with, with investigators decades after the fact. Yeah, true that. So they, you know, when they go a couple days later, they might mean five or six days or a week later, you I'll know. I'll give you that, sure. We, we don't, we don't know, and that's, again, part of the problem with getting into all this stuff is you're also battling memories, and a lot of times people will contradict themselves. Uh, but I think the important thing is that there were, you know, people did see stuff um, leading up to the crash Most flying definitely. around uh, New Mexico. So according to the story on the night of July 3rd, uh, there was also a big storm, an electrical storm, uh, typical for Roswell's monsoon season. Cowboy and foreman Mac Brazel was hanging out in his modest cabin on the Roberts Ranch in Corona when he thought he heard a large crash. So there's a theory that whatever fell that night was struck by lightning and Mm -hmm. caused the craft to career... uh, Career? Careen. Thank you. Uh, out of control. And basically what it does, there's basically we're going to find out that there's there's not just one crash site. There's there's two and maybe or, or three. And what they think happened is this craft came struck by lightning, came down in the ranch, dug a huge trench, scattered a bunch of debris, and then went back up into the air, flew for a couple more miles before crashing into the side of a hill. Yeah. So, wow. so it's basically like in Lost... If you ever watched Lost, how there was like two sections of the plane, there was the, the cabin and then the tail. So uh-huh. this thing strikes, breaks off a big part of the craft as yep. it wobbles down. That crashes, and then the rest of the uh, rest of the craft uh, crashes like two or three miles uh, away, maybe even further than that. Well, I, to I have help, to double check them. To help visually, yeah, think of it like that. This thing hits the ground, the tail completely, or half of the saucer completely comes off, uh, goes back into the air, bodies start falling out, and it finally lands uh, somewhere about 40 miles north of the crash site. Uh, you know, Wait, disc 40? and all. Or zero? Yeah, I yeah, think it was 40. 40 miles. And it bounced 40 miles? Yeah, so, there, so they posit that there was possibly two locations where bodies were deposited um, not just one so yeah one start was the- two uh. miles from the debris field which we'll get into and then the other where they said the cockpit of the crash uh, of the craft crashed 40 right. miles away right all right also side note mac brazel is a great cowboy oh, so, i mean dude. yeah and- <laughs> come on <laughs> so good Mac Brazel. Yeah, Mac Brazel is this old school cowboy. Uh, you would, I mean, he really is exactly like how you think about him, Riley. He's living out on this ranch by himself. It's not his. He's just a hired hand, basically. He's tending uh, sheep out there. And he's living in this tiny little cabin called the Heinz House. It has no electricity, no running water. He's basically living in in like the past century like he's li- he might as well have been living in the 1840s yeah. because, you know what i mean we're talking and about so a salt all- of the earth guy you know yeah and that's also what's so cool about this story is it and it's almost kind of like has a little bit of a biblical kind of nature to it where like a shepherd finds this thing yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean yeah i like that and you have like this the mo you have like future tech meeting old school cowboy tech well he was, <laughs> he, was a shep- Just- he was a shepherd i mean most of what they do on the on ranches out there uh in that area is is herd sheep and and uh produce sheep so yeah that's that makes sense that's a great uh 
Yeah, I like looking at it like that. So the next day on the 4th of July, while doing ranch work, Brazel and seven-year-old Dee Proctor, who was the son of another rancher family that lived nearby, friends of Brazel's, they allegedly came across a giant debris field that was 300 yards wide and about a mile what? long. So this what? thing is huge. Now, just I want to take note of that when later we're going to hear that this is a crashed weather balloon. 300 yards wide and a mile long. So that's like three football fields wide. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that part where we said part of the craft came down and skidded across before it bounced back up into the sky, just letting all this debris everywhere. Now, this stuff that they find, Bryce, let's talk about this. What does this, uh, what's the debris like? Yeah, so a lot of people described uh, this material as, well, they described multiple materials, but the one that stuck out mostly in people's minds uh, were these very thin, like, pieces of what looked like aluminum. They often described it as, like, the top of a cigarette pack um, that you could easily manipulate and crumple in your hand, but as soon as you opened up your hand, it would go back to its original shape. They called it memory metal, and 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 it was strong as all get out. Right? We'll, we'll we'll talk about more about it later about how people tried to cut this stuff, burn it, tear it, couldn't do it. Uh, it was extremely malleable, and yet it was extremely strong. Yeah. So Brazel's just standing out there with this kid. And they're like wadding it up and tossing it in the air, and then watching it float down like a leaf. Mm. There's like all this weird shit, and they're like they don't they've never seen anything like it. Um, Dee's mother described it because what they do is then they take this stuff over to the proctor's house and he shows Dee's mom and dad and they're looking at it and later she went on to say it was almost like plastic but they didn't have that type of plastic back then so they they really couldn't wrap their minds about around a what this was and then what it was made of Bra- Brazel also found what he uh, an eye beam Yes, let's talk about these I-beams, yeah. So there's supposedly these I-beams that when they were looking at them, they had printing along the center of it uh, that that ran up and down the I-beam that looked like writing of some kind. They mm-hmm. called them hieroglyphics without the animals in it. Right. So they, they didn't know what this um, language was. They didn't know if it was some type of code. Uh, they couldn't recognize these strange symbols. And yeah. Brazel's not the only one who saw the I beam. Well, th- that's sort of a prop that carries through the story. Well, and the government so, would say that it was scotch tape with flowers on it, uh, right? Which is interesting. Check but out. you know, here's where I want to start talking about some of these conveniences, right? First of all, the material that they're finding that's supposed to be extraterrestrial is thin, looks like aluminum, and very light, but. Yet that's the same material as these radar targets, right? We're talking about like basically like aluminum here. How convenient is that, right? And then and then the I beams as well. People are seeing I beams uh, that they describe with strange hieroglyphics. Well, you know what else it took to make some of those radar targets on stuff like Project Mogul was balsa wood I beams. So, so by ra- radar targets, you're talking about like I'm, weather balloons. Basically. I'm talking the, about the- weather balloons that would go up into the sky and attach to these weather balloons down below were these sort of triangular-shaped, geometric-shaped uh, targets, for lack of a better word, that were equipped with aluminum so that they would bing off radars. Um, so it, I just always found it like, God, that's so strange that people would be descri- – that the, that the material that w- takes to make an extraterrestrial craft looks – and sort of seems like the same material of these radar weather targets. It's so strange. Well, and the thing that we have to remember, too, is that with the airfield out in Roswell, ranchers were seeing weather balloons and finding them on their properties all the time. Absolutely. Mac Mac Brazel uh, would sometimes find this stuff, collect it, and then bring it into town yeah. and, and and resell it to the army because this dude was a poor motherfucker. This yeah. guy was scrapping and saving. So if they found stuff that belonged to the army on the ranch, oftentimes these guys would take it into town and sell it for cheap, but get, you know, sell it for drinking money. And uh, so they know what these, they know what weather balloons look like. And also we need to mention weather balloons were not top secret back in the 
1940s. People right. knew that these things existed. I think now, one the- thing every witness can agree on, and, and here's another misconception. There were hundreds of witnesses, but they will all agree that this was no weather balloon. Right. So word quickly started spreading around the ranching community that something strange had crashed in Corona the previous night. Up to 75 people supposedly wandered the area collecting debris. And according to authors and Roswell investigators Tom Carey and Donald R. Schmidt, who wrote the book Witness to Roswell that was a big part of research for us, there was some memory metal even passed around a 4th of July rodeo. Right. This And this is all before the authorities were ever informed that something out of this world world had happened bryce why don't you talk about the bar this is one of my favorite parts of this of mac brazel's story yeah right so mac has in his hands the strangest material and he's fascinated by it and he's showing it to neighbors hey what do you think this is he's giving pieces away finally uh, totally frustrated he goes to a bar in town called wade's bar uh where he starts passing it around patrons and, you know, everybody's drinking and and they're all just sort of like trying to burn it, trying to cut it, you know? So it's like everybody in this bar is like, man, I don't know what that is. Here, pass me a piece. So it's just like, you know, they're drinking and toying around with basically uh, uh, space parts. It's fucking great just to, just to think of it in my mind, you know? Yeah, and I think it was someone at Wade's Bar who said, hey, maybe this is part of one of those flying saucers we keep hearing about. Maybe there's a flying saucer that crashed on on the ranch. That's right. And and he had heard, this patron had heard on the radio uh, that there was some national station that was offering up to $3,000 for proof of flying saucers. Because remember, this is like the hot thing at the time. So Brazel thinks about that, and he goes back to the debris field on the 5th with D and his neighbor, another neighbor kid, Sidney Jack Wright, possibly others. Okay, so this is when we, this is when there's so, some some holes in the story that we're trying to put, put together, but um, this might have been the day when Brazel and company stumbled across something else about two and a half miles from the scattered debris field, and that was an alien body. Hmm. The um, we we get this from Jack Sidney Wright, who told uh, who, to- who told Schmidt and Carey that there were bodies. I'm um, quote unquote. There were bodies, small bodies with big heads and eyes, and Mac was there too. We couldn't get away from there fast enough. So allegedly, D, Mac, and at least this one other kid saw these bodies. Now, this isn't the main crash. So this isn't where the where the cockpit of the, of the saucer was. This is just a few miles away. Yeah. But the big problem, from all accounts, was that Brazel finally got fed up with this debris because the sheep would not come near it, and he couldn't get the sheep to cross the field. So... Coupled with that problem and coupled with this idea that maybe there would be a big reward for this stuff, he loads up his beat-up old pickup truck with some of the materials and drove 75 miles down into Roswell to speak with Sheriff George Wilcox. And while Brazel was talking to the sheriff, it just so happened that local radio KGFL DJ, a man named Frank Joyce called looking for any news of the day you know the radio station would call and say hey have you made any arrests have you done anything you know it's a small sleepy kind of town not a lot of stuff happens so the sheriff now there's two versions of this and the book contradicts itself at one point the sheriff is bored with mac's story and then and then in another version of the story the sheriff is very intrigued Mm. either way the sheriff hands the phone over to mac brazel and goes here why don't you tell frank joyce what you found in your field Right, right. So it was his so, day off, and he actually lived right above the jail cell. So him and his family were eat, right. eating dinner. So he's like, I, "Yeah, that's not as fancy. I ain't got time for that. My steaks yeah, getting it was, cold." It Here, was tell Sunday. Him about your, your space tech. Yeah, tell yeah, the radio it was, man. <laughs> it was Sunday, so he was annoyed. It was Sunday on a holiday weekend, so he was annoyed that this rancher's coming down with this metal, complaining that somebody needs to go up there and clean up the debris. So, um, so anyway, so Brazel talks to Frank Joyce, and we're going to read from this book. This is Frank Joyce recalling how the conversation went. And uh, Bryce, why don't you play Mac Brazel, and I'm going to play Joyce. Who's going to clean all that stuff up? That's what I want to know. I need someone out there to clean it up. What stuff? What are you talking about? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's from one of them 
flying saucer things. <laughs> really? Well, then you should call the air base. They are responsible for everything that flies in the air. They should be able to help you or tell you what it is. God, what am I going to do? It's, it's horrible. I mean, horrible. Just what, what's horrible. That? What, wait, what's horrible? What are you talking about? The stench. It's just awful. Stench from what? What are you talking about? They're dead. What? Who's dead? Little people. Unfortunate little creatures. What, wait, this is crazy. What, what, what the? Where? Where did you find them? Someplace else. Well, you know, the military is always firing rockets and experimenting with monkeys and things, so... God damn it, it they're not monkeys. monkeys. Maybe it was... And they're not human. So Joyce recommended that Brazel take the materials to Roswell Army Airfield and speak with the head of the base, Colonel William Blanchard. Now, uh, I just want to like, I just yeah. want to th- say, like, think about how just what Mac wanted to do was get his sheep to water, right? And he was saying that his sheep would not cross that debris field. If this is just some, you know, weather balloon like the army said it was, I'm pretty sure the sheep wouldn't have a hard time getting to water. But something about this material that laid bare on his land, the sheep would not go near it. And, uh, and of course, this is what motivated him to be like, somebody's got to get this shit off my property. Right. So he goes to William Blanchard at the uh, at the airfield. And Blanchard's a big plays a pretty big role in this story. He's the commanding officer of the base. He would go on, Riley, to become a four star general. And he actually died from a heart attack sitting at his desk in the Pentagon in 1966. Like, this guy (laughs) was serious military. And at this time, he was the highest ranking officer on the base, but he also answered to General Ron Ramey, who was stationed in Fort Worth, Texas. So that's the guy who's commanding him while he has command of the entire base. So Blanchard assigns head intelligence officer Jesse Marcel Sr., and counterintelligence officer Sheridan Cavett to go up to the Foster Ranch with Brazel and collect the remaining debris. Now, these guys are the ones who get the job because Jesse Marcel, as head intelligence officer, if there was anything, if there was ever a plane or anything that ever wrecked, he would be one of the guys going out there to investigate and find out what what happened, what went wrong, right? Anything Just that think involved about that any type of level of intelligence at the base... He's the head of intelligence at the 509th Atomic Strike Force. So just think about how much, you know, his upper superiors trusted this guy. And, you know, obviously competent, it does not go, does not speak highly enough of, of, of this guy's capabilities, you know? Right, right. Sure. And Sheridan yeah. Cavett was counter head of counterintelligence. So this is a guy, if there is a foreign uh, investigation or a foreign threat, he's going to be involved. So he's sent up there because if this isn't one of ours, if this is something that, say, the Russians uh, were flying over New Mexico, then he'd need to take a look at it as well, right? So they go up there. Uh, Meanwhile, word is already spreading around town that a flying saucer had crashed north of Roswell. There's stories of like young guys getting on their motorcycles and driving up to the ranch to look for stuff. Children on horseback. Everybody. It seemed like the whole town knew about this crash uh, before the authorities did. Because it's a small town. You know, word spreads really, really quickly. Um, so Marcel and Cavett go up. They spend the night in the Heinz house with Mac Brazel eating cold beans, and which would just suck. I mean, if you had to go up there and just be like, God damn it, it's Sunday night, and now I have to go s- sleep in a cabin in the desert that has no electricity. You know, both of these guys, are, I believe, are both family men. You know, it's like, I got to go drag my ass up here with this old cowboy. So they go up there. And at daylight, uh, so now we're on uh, Monday, July 7th. Yeah, but you have to remember, Michael, that Mac Brazel brought in samples to the Roswell I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. These guys were obviously had held this stuff in their hand. And Mac's saying, there's a whole shit ton of it. You guys need to come get it. Take a look and see what's... So they're probably immediately thinking, you know, in the backs of their minds, something fucking crashed out on that field. 
No, I know. It's just I like the idea of having to go sleep in a tiny little kid. Like this is it's like the mundane elements of this story are really appealing. Oh yeah, to me. totally, totally. Um, so they wake up first thing in the morning. They go out to the debris field, and Cavett returned to the base midday with some of the materials. And more army personnel were called up by the end of the day, and there was still allegedly a football field sized area covered in debris on Monday night. So these, they send people back up there and there are soldiers just walking in lines, shoulder to shoulder, marching through the desert and just picking up any piece of metal or any object that doesn't look organic or doesn't look like it belongs in the desert. Yeah. Marcel and Cavett put, I mean, filled two vehicles, two trucks full of the stuff. Now, if this is just some weather balloon with a target, you could fit that in the back of your trunk of a Buick. You know what I mean? But yet, to fill two full fucking cars, and, and just to speak on, on who Jesse Marcel was, he was a major. He received a diploma in 1945 from the Army Air Force's training command in what? Radar technology at Langley. Virginia. So he was highly trained in radar tracking materials and equipment, including Raywind targets and ML-307 reflectors, which were the dominant parts of Project Mogul Balloon devices. So just to say that this guy, and we'll get into later what happens to Marcel, doesn't know what the fuck he's looking at is ludicrous and beyond reproach. Yeah, so Project Mogul, for those wondering, that's what later, later, the Army would come out and say, all of this was a weather balloon from a secret project that we were calling Project Mogul, Mm -hmm. and we were sending up these weather balloons high into the atmosphere, and the goal was to detect whether or not Russia was blowing up nukes with these sensors. They were trying to get, literally, listen for Russian uh, for Russian nukes being tested, right? So that so when we talk about Project Mogul, that's that's what they would later come out and say was behind all of this. But here's the thing: the the, the project was top secret, but weather balloons were not, right? Yeah. So they didn't have to make a big deal out of it. They could have just said it's just a weather balloon. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It didn't have to. It didn't. It wouldn't require this type of response. Well, and I think I should add here: it was the it was the state at Roswell Army Airfield where they did launch weather balloon projects. So it's not like the people on the base weren't familiar with these things going up in the air. I imagine probably a lot of the soldiers would like to see these things take off from the the airfield. You know what I mean? They're probably cool to watch. But the point is, is they launched weather balloons all the time. Yes. Right. That's what we were saying. That's why ranchers knew how to recognize them. So anyway, at some point on Monday, KGFL owner, that's a radio station owner, Walt Whitmore, who wanted to go public with the Brazel flying saucer story, sent for Brazel up in Corona and brought him down to his house for a private recorded interview. Yeah, you got to say this is the scoop of the lifetime. The station had already signed off for the day, so they would broadcast an interview the next day. So not only was Whitmore being an intrepid reporter after a scoop, maybe the biggest scoop of all time, like Bryce said, he had a feeling that with all the buzz surrounding this mysterious UFO crash, Brazel was about to become a hot commodity. So keeping him at his house was also a way of keeping him safe. On the morning of Tuesday, July 8th, Whitmore sat down with co-owner of KGFL, George Judd Roberts, and they interviewed Brazel about his findings on Foster Ranch. They recorded a full interview about this stuff, and we never got it. We've never been able to hear this because of what happened next. The order of events that happened are, are a little unclear, but shortly after that interview, Roberts received a call at KGFL from a man named T.J. Slowey. And I know we're throwing a lot of names at you guys, but bear with us. T.J. Slowey, he was the executive secretary of the FCC, and he told Roberts not to air the interview due to national security issues. Mm -hmm. If they did, KGFL would lose their license. As Robert's head started spinning, he received another phone call from U.S. Senator of New Mexico, Dennis Chavez, who urged Roberts to follow orders. Roberts pleaded for help in changing the FCC's mind on the matter, but Chavez simply told Roberts the situation was out of his hands. So by Tuesday morning, Washington is aware of what's happening, right? And the Quick Wilcox- question on that. Yeah. Wait, real quick. When was the War of the Worlds 
uh, back in the 30s. That's like the early 30s. 30s. But that's a, that's okay. a really good question because that's sort of in the back of people's minds, I think, right. in terms of like why they would want to maybe – one of the reasons they'd want to cover something up. up Absolutely. Because – Right. They're like, you know, do we want this broadcast? The FCC is coming in like, oh, uh, you're going to spread panic. Yeah. Uh, we just like people wrapped up World died. War II. died. People died yeah. because panicked and drove their cars off the road and you died. Know, for those for those who aren't right. familiar with what Riley's talking about, he's talking about in the 30s, uh, Orson Welles did did a play, uh, a radio play of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, and it was so realistic um, that it caused a nationwide panic. Yeah, it was like one of the first meta um pieces of art because they just even though they said that this is a, is fictional they aired it yeah. as if it was a real time um uh, radio news report people about stopped what they invading. were doing and they all listened into their radios and a panic ensued right. uh people some people even committed suicide that's how serious yeah people they died. took the th- and it was a forerunner it gave the government an idea just Exactly. What? How would the public react if they got information of otherworldly visitors? So that that that's a great point, Riley. Yeah, War of the Worlds was broadcast on October thirtieth, nineteen thirty eight. So less than ten years before this. So everyone, that's a pretty recent memory. You know, all things considered, for the men and women involved in this story. Right. Um, so. Dennis Chavez, the, the the senator's like, no, 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 dude, this I, I can't help you out here. You got to listen to FCC. Do not broadcast this. Um, so, yeah. So so a sister station, KSWS in Roswell, this guy, jo- uh, John McBoyle, uh, his general manager and part owner of that station. He heard about this story. He knew that um, KGFL was going to drop this. He calls KOAT in Albuquerque. Uh, to transmit the Associated Press Wire Service. And he calls this woman, uh, Lydia Sleppy, who was the secretary at the Albuquerque station. And he says, uh, Lydia, get ready for a scoop. We, we want to get this on the wire right away. Listen to this. A flying saucer has crashed. No, I'm not joking. It crashed near Roswell. So Sleppy urgently asked program director and acting station manager Carl Lamberts to witness her reception of the story and its transmission. Using the teletype, Sleppy alerted ABC News headquarters in Hollywood to expect a high bulletin story. Mm -hmm. Lambert's looked on as she initiated the connection. It's a big crumpled dishpan, Boyle, hardly containing himself, continued over the phone. And get this, they're saying something about little little men being on board. That's right, but before Sleppy could type out just a couple of sentences, guess what came in? A teletype on the line went beep, 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 beep. Attention, Albuquerque. Do not transmit. Repeat. Do not transmit this message. Stop communication immediately. National security matter. So in stunned belief, she said, uh, yeah, we're not running that. Yeah, and she also checked in with McBoyle about it later, and he wouldn't talk about it anymore. Uh, according to the book, he says, forget about it. You never heard it. Look, you're not supposed to know. Don't talk about it anymore. So what we're seeing on Tuesday, uh, July 8th, is the cover-up starting to happen. And all these events are really kind of overlapping themselves. And it all seems to be moving really rapidly at this point. Yeah, and this you is the clamp think, down. Yeah, and so Mac Brazel's tracked down. Sheriff Wilcox finds him at... Um, at, at, at the house of, of Whitmore, the, the station owner, and uh, he tracks Brazel down, and Brazel is now suddenly taken into military for questioning at the base for the next 24 hours. And that afternoon, the Roswell Daily Record, which was the afternoon paper, this is back when newspapers had morning and afternoon editions. I remember that growing up in Kansas City. Wow. Um, they ran the story. RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. And this story had been sent to them from the press secretary at the base, and a man named William Hout, Hout or Hout, H O A W T, who was told by Blanchard to let this story out. And we're going to get more into that in the next episode. Well, just hold on. Let that, let that just sink in for a second. Let that just sink in. Marcel and Captain Cabot You're were really sent making out. us stop and think for a few seconds. Well, hold on. But, on this. but hold on. Marcel and Cabot brought material back to the base. Material that they would know right away was not some weather balloon, but from some foreign object, probably from space. Why? Because this memory metal was doing insane things that nobody on Earth had ever seen. Giving Colonel Blanchard the idea to, to report 
to give out to his press secretary there at the base, put it over the air, we got a flying saucer. Imagine the pride he must have felt, you know? I mean, it's insane to think that he actually let that headline slip out to the press before going through the higher-uppers. And if he didn't, th- then we would never have this story. There would be rumors about it, and people That's would right. be talking about it, but it would not be the Roswell story that we know today because the newspaper ran with the headline and the story that Mac Brazel had found a flying saucer up at the Foster Ranch. That's exactly so, right. Within hours of that, General Ron Ramey, the Blanchard's commanding officer from Fort Worth, would re- rewrite the story from a press conference in Fort Worth, claiming that the debris was simply that of a crashed weather balloon. Well, plainly so, put, the shit hit the fan once yeah. that headline went out. Their phone started ringing off the hook. And Washington found out, and I'm sure it went up to Truman, and they were like, what the fuck are you guys doing? And again, this is <laughs> we go back to, there was no protocol for this. They're trying to work this out in real time. What do we What do? We do? And I, see, I have a theory that something changed, something quickly uh, caused the cover-up. And my theory is, that was the discovery of the bodies. Mm-hmm. I think once they found bodies, they went, oh, fuck. And they went, we have to zip this up. Um, that's my speculation. I'm sure other people have that theory as well. Because because what happened uh, between July 7th and July 8th is if you were walking down Main Street around midday on Tuesday, you might have noticed a large truck called a low boy hauling what appeared to be a large egg-shaped object covered in a tarp towards the military base and That's that right. would be the cockpit that would be the that would be the 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 chunk of the ship where they had found supposedly found the bodies in the third crash site. And that's not a place Mac Brazel ever went to. That was found by the army when they were up there collecting the debris and flying over and they they find this thing. And there are other uh, potential witnesses that also found that cockpit. We're not going to get into those today. We'll get into that on a future episode. Um, but that's my theory is that once they were once they went, oh fuck, we have pilots, <laughs> they went shut it down. Yeah. Yeah, so no doubt about it. Brazel was released uh, by the base, but was escorted by the military who marched him into the Roswell Daily Record, where he was forced to recant his story. And the headline that ran the next day read, Harassed rancher who located saucer, sorry he told it. And that's a fascinating headline to me, right? That feels really loaded. That almost feels like the the reporter of that story is secretly writing what really happened, right? It doesn't say the thing was false or misidentified. The headline reads, harassed rancher who located saucer is sorry he told it, right? Yeah. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. (laughs) Well, talk about putting the fire out. He was literally escorted by security officers to the radio station, uh, you know, shoulder in hand. Yeah, first to the newspaper and then to the radio station. But in the, I want to focus on the newspaper story for a quick second before we go back to KGFL, Bryce. In this story, a couple things come up to me. In this story, he says that he found the the wreckage on June 14th, which was almost a month earlier. And that's fascinating to me because uh, that's th- this is where we get this conflicting timeline. Mm, um, yeah. We we hear it happen on July first originally, but then in this recanted in a different version of the story, Brazel says the fourteenth. So I wonder if that was the military asking him to put a little distance, you know, and create this sort of new alternate timeline. I don't know. You know, it but could even just be a typo, honestly. It could be, um, and or maybe this stuff was really up there for much longer than uh, Carrie and Schmidt have it in their own timeline. But um, he ends the interview, he ends the story with this quote, and this to me says it all. I'm sure what I found was not any weather observation balloon, but if I find anything else besides a bomb, they're going to have a hard time getting me to say anything about it. Hmm. So they also escorted him after that to KGFL, 
And uh, Bryce, why don't you read this passage from the book? This is what um, he he runs into. He comes in and he says, sorry, boys, I didn't find a flying saucer. What I found was a weather balloon. And uh, Roberts, or was it Roberts or was it? Um, Joyce. Uh, Joyce. Joyce goes, you know, Joyce chases him out after the, the that he after he recants a story and he goes, hey, that's not the story you told me before. You know, and Brazel feels awful. He basically says, they told me it would go hard on me if I didn't do what they said. And so he, uh, presumably, Brazel had been warned of the dire consequences, not to the nation, but to Brazel and his family, if he said anything that conflicted with the Army Air Force's new official story. At that point, Joyce noticed the uniformed men standing just outside the glass door entrance. The reporter made one last attempt to get the truth. What about the little green men you told me about the other day? The rancher paused as he walked over the door, put his hand on the doorknob. Turning towards Joyce, he casually said in a soft-spoken, matter-of-fact voice, They weren't green. And out he went. And that concludes part one of Roswell. All right. Bum, bum, bum. Um, fellas. <laughs> It's a lot, man. It's- Next week, we're going to get into the Army's point of view and what happened with Marcel and Cavett and those guys after they reco- recovered the debris from the field. And then we're going to tell the story about what happened to Marcel during the cover-up, which was basically sort of um, dumped on him yeah, it was the fall without, guy. without his knowledge. He becomes the fall guy for this entire story. And that is a really fascinating aspect to this whole Well, whole and we tale. need to talk about the, the human aspect of the threats and the, and the intimidation that the ranchers and their children received from army personnel Allegedly. all over New Mexico. No, 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 no. You, there were, there were ranch wives that said, these people I know, people buddy, came but we got to protect ourselves. <laughs> we well, can't well, slander the still, I, I'm on. saying it's according Allegedly. to their story. <laughs> Allegedly ripped up their floorboards, cut open their furniture, I mean, emptied their water tanks because they knew, they just knew that people had collected this metal. Yeah, and apparently it was stashed they stashed all over the town. They went up to Corona and all those cowboys and ranchers that were passing around this stuff, they they managed to track everybody down and confiscate it and tell them to keep quiet and threaten people. Um, yeah, it's a really fascinating thing. And that little boy, D. Proctor, he never, he never ever went on to talk about what he saw until he died. He never spoke to reporters. He never spoke to investigators. We only know about him being involved through that, um, that the other boy that had been up there. And uh, it's kind of a sad thing. Like apparently he was so freaked out by what he initially saw, which was maybe an alien body. Yeah. And then, and then the military, driving around and telling kids, uh, you know, shut the fuck up. There was allegedly, there was a story that a military man told one of the girls. He says, you know, little girl, little girls go missing in the desert all the time. That's right. Oh, that's a nice thing to say. And and, and there you get the idea that, that the kids and the children and the ranchers who saw, let's call them the bodies were inadvertently affected for life. It's one thing to see some metallic debris and go, yeah, maybe that's ours. Maybe it's a top secret project. Maybe it's not ours, but that's not going to, that's not going to haunt you. You know what I mean? People saw something lying on that desert floor. And you got to remember, you know, this is, this is a very sort of religious community. The people, the way people contextualize their place in the universe changed in the matter of minutes upon seeing something that they just could not would and not it's, explain it's not also just bodies it's bodies that have been sitting out in the desert rotting for at least like three or four days if not yeah. since june if we go by that timeline yeah um and the other right. big thing that I, an important note to make is that in 1947 right after world war ii Uncle Sam was super well respected. The people, uh, the American public had lots of uh, respect and trust for the government and the military. Yeah. So we just liberated France. We just won a world war. Yeah. And thank God we're not all speaking German. And (laughs) apologies to our German listeners. (laughs) But, uh, but so when the government said, you don't talk, you didn't. 
You know, you you yeah. you it, it appealed just, to their patriotism. Yeah, you know, so, their sense of their sense of national statehood, and and that makes sense. You know, and to the public who it weren't does. involved, yeah. if the government said it was a it was a weather balloon, then it was a weather balloon. It wasn't, yeah. you know, people went, okay, we trust you, let's move on. And that's essentially what happened, was that everyone just, this story quickly died down, and the American public basically forgets about this yeah. for 30 years until Stanton Friedman finds a document that makes some mention of this and starts dig starts digging up the past and going over and talking to witnesses and basically finds Jesse Marcel Sr. And Jesse Marcel Sr. in his old age, dying of lung cancer, basically starts spilling the beans. And that's what we're going to get into mm-hmm. next week. Look, look, this book is called the, the, the book that we really kind of went over for the majority of our research is called Witness to Roswell. And it's called Witness to Roswell for a reason, because there is about 300 plus witnesses uh, who were there at the time, who had family, who heard about this. And I want to point out, you know, the deathbed confession of some of these officers and security personnel and people who touched the material, saw the bodies speaks volumes. You know, we're going to get into all of that stuff. People want to go to their grave with a clear conscience. And that so speaks truth to me of what these people say they saw. Before we move on, guys, can I can I ask a couple questions? Now Absolutely kind of not. No. Laid out this no. <laughs> no. Do Everything is there for you. That's the. <laughs> <laughs> of course. What are you thinking? Okay. So ba- okay. So basically, the very well told guys. Truly, I, I, that's uh, you've really painted the picture here for me, and I think it seems very clear that the weather balloon cl- cover story is not is a cover story. It's not. That's not true. Um, but. I, I wonder, like, was this just them experimenting with top secret uh, weaponry and aircraft and they crashed and or blew up? It's a great something question. Like maybe one of these V2 rockets and then they set up this whole weather balloon cover story just to cover that. Possibly. But Riley, what we're going to get into in the next episode or two is that the you'll see that the government goes on for decades releasing in the 90s they went okay this is what really happened and they mentioned project mogul and then year a few years later or i think in the 70s early 80s and then years later in the 90s they go okay we okay that's not true here's what really happened we were dumping these dummies out of like high altitude to see like if they would fall apart like they keep what Mike explaining saying, what it is over and over again to the point where they become a completely unreliable narrator as well. Yeah, and the more right. the more they try to explain away the crash UFO stuff, the less sense it starts to make. Now, are right. they covering up some other type of top secret project? Sure, like a long maybe. Range There's tactical lo- nuclear of course. Missile. Let, let me add this though. There's let me add this. Right there. there are all sorts of theories that might explain this. Riley, but, if but, it, but, but, but wait, let me finish my point. When you hear. This this stuff from Marcel's point of view and what happens to him, I, I think you might you, you'll understand why we're leaning into something that's more of an interdimensional or extraterrestrial. Sure, right? yeah. No, but, I mean I want to go there. I'm just saying that from what I've heard, that's where my mind goes. Okay, it's let's like, let's assume for a second that it was a top secret military project launched out of the 509th or somewhere else near there. Okay, right. Let's assume that it was a top secret military project, and it went down. Why wasn't anyone looking for it? I mean, why I did think- it, why why were ranchers and kids and 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 everybody else uh, looking at this stuff and playing with this stuff four days before anybody in the military actually thought about coming to look for it? You know, it doesn't. That is an it, interesting point. It doesn't make point. sense. You know, if this is a top secret project and it goes down, believe me, they know where it's going to go down and if it went down, and they're going to send out military personnel to pick this shit up before anybody else. Sure. Okay. Interesting point. Interest. I'm intrigued. Interesting counterpoint. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we got to wrap this up for this week. Uh, we're super excited to get into the next part of this. We hope you enjoyed this. This is, you know, you're really going down the rabbit hole with us. And in, in, uh, I keep saying in real time in this episode, but like, <laughs> you know, this is an experiment for us. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please do us a favor. Go on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five star review. If you do, we might read it. 
on the air like this one from Mary Moon 10 uh, from July 22nd. She says, just the right amount of funny and strange. I was looking for something to fill the space that bizarre states left while on hiatus. And this did just a trick. I look forward to every Wednesday. Thanks for the laughs and thought experiments. Five stars. That's awesome. Thank you, Mary cool. Moon 10. Thank you. Uh, boys, before we go, anything to plug? No, no, not really. All right. Uh, you can watch for me on Perry Mason. Uh, Bryce, you got your game that's coming out. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Please go to our website, the dpcugame.com. Give us your email. We're going to let you know when soon as pre- pre-sale orders are ready. We have a free online version that we just launched, so you can sample it. Try it out. You guys are going to absolutely fucking love this game. Oh, and I'm working on another top se- secret project. Oh, we know all about that, but we can't say anything. Yeah. Uh, sure. Dirty picture cover up. That's awesome. Uh, good luck. I cannot wait for this to get in the hands of the filthy minds of our listeners. Um, and then finally, follow us on uh, Bigfoot Collectors Club on Instagram at Bigfoot Pod on Twitter. Until next week, Roswell Part night. Two. And good don't... night. <laughs> Let's Until... try that again. Yeah. <laughs> Until next week, good night. And go get regressed. Bigfoot Collectors Club is produced by Riley Bray. Our theme song is Come Alone by Sun Eaters, courtesy of Lotus Pool Records. If you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It really helps get the podcast to more listeners. To support the show, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock multiple reward episodes every month.